Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's Coffee Microcaps morning meeting. My name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps for anybody who might be joining us for the first time this morning. And if you're one of our regular attendees, you're welcome back to this morning's event. I'm just going to quickly run through a couple of intro slides and then we're going to get straight into it with the first of our four presenters this morning. Uh, first off, I'd like to acknowledge DMX Asset Management, who are sponsors for all the virtual events here, Coffee Microcaps. If you are looking for a smaller or microcap active fund manager, be sure to check out their website or indeed reach out to Stephen or Michael for the relevant uh, PDS. Uh, we'll just go through this disclaimer slide. And for anybody who is joining us here this morning, the companies we normally have presenting on here are capped under 300 million in revenue and approaching cash flow break even, or indeed are already profitable. Generally, we don't have companies from the resources or biotech sector, uh, what I call industrial microcaps, and that spans pretty much every other industrial sector, it can be microcap financial services, industrial engineering products, healthcare, retail, financial services. Uh, just a catch-all term I use, industrial microcaps. Uh, structure this morning's webinar, uh, we've got four companies rather than two presenting this morning, so we're going to be here for two hours. Each company's got a 30-minute slot, which we roughly break down into a 20-minute prezzo, 10 minutes of Q&A. If you do have any questions for our presenters, um, please type them in the Q&A box rather than the chat function. It just makes it easier for me to moderate the questions to our presenters. And please note the webinar is being recorded and it'll be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel. Uh, not tomorrow, because tomorrow is Cup Day, but probably on Wednesday morning. Uh, you can follow us pretty much on all the socials, Twitter, uh, YouTube, as I say, for the recording of this morning's event and indeed the other 70 odd uh, webinars we've done over the last two and a bit years are also on there. Uh, LinkedIn, and I also write a free monthly newsletter, which just went out over the weekend on the Substack newsletter platform, if you want to sign up for that. Uh, our first presenter this morning, we're actually welcoming back Scott Farding, uh, CEO of EVZ. After that, we'll be welcoming back John Kelly from Atomo Diagnostics. Uh, then we've got two new presenters uh, coming up. Then we've got Michael Cooper is going to be joining us from Hobart for Pure Food Tasmania. And then newly listed Halo Technology Holdings, uh, George Paxson is going to be joining us uh, as our fourth presenter this morning. But that's enough from me. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand you over to Scott. Scott, if you want to start sharing your Prezo, I'll let you know when I can see it coming up on the screen now. Yeah. And there you go. Yeah, you're in full screen mode now. Scott, uh, good to go whenever you are. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to Cup Day Eve here. I'm sitting in Melbourne. Um, and I'd just like to bring you a bit of an update <clears throat> on EVZ Limited and where we're up to in our journey. Um, and really, um, there's a couple of things that happened since last time I've spoken, Coffee and Microcaps, and obviously this has all been transmitted through the ASX. So if you're following our business on there, none of this will be a surprise. Uh, that we probably nothing new that um, for today because we've got... Um, Lots of uh, announcements coming through over the next few weeks with um, AGMs and other things that we're doing in the business that you'll find out about through the right channels. But this is just an update. So our, our businesses are all in the technical or engineering services sector, servicing large industrial players really to achieve their capital and operating goals. Uh, whether we're designing or uh, constructing or supplying or maintaining or just servicing or supporting with technical advice, those players, uh, we're really here as an, a business to be a bit unique in each of our brands um, and really just service their their needs to a really quality outcome. You know, we never squawk away from or walk away from being a, a quality provider of great advice and uh, good outcomes, no matter what the journey is. So our four businesses are Brockman <clears throat> Engineering, Siphon Systems, a new a new addition just recently, Tank Industries, and TSF Power. 
So I'll just quickly run through each of those businesses to give you a bit of an, an update. Um, Rockman Engineering, it's um, it's it, it it's a large engineering business. It's our biggest engineering business. It's located in North Geelong. It serves the liquid fuels, chemical, mining, and water industries, and we design and construct components for those sort types of uh, industries. So in the in the liquid fuels and water industries and chemical and the like, we build large water chemicals or oil or condensate storage tanks. Um, you know anything from five that's five or ten a ten meters diameter, twelve meters diameter, and twenty meters high, if they be so up to a hundred meters diameter. So very large units, ones that can't be, be built in a factory, they have to be built on site. The steel used in those tanks can be um, anything up to 40 millimetres thick and 12 metres long in sheets of 12 or 9 by 3 and very large specialised equipment. We build all of the pipework networks, the electrics and all the other parts that make that part of a plant. So refineries were our game. As the refineries shut down, terminals were our games. Mining sites are, are where we spend our time water infrastructure for all the new um, and growing uh, com communities in Australia, if you've got the western suburbs of Melbourne, but so the northwest of Sydney and the southwest of Sydney and many other places where there are just replacement tanks for the existing infrastructures that have been um, uh, dilapidated or just uh, growing communities that are have a greater need for water storage. Um, you know, our clients are people like ExxonMobil, Ampol, Viva, uh, Rio Tinto, Melbourne Water, Sydney Water, Greater Western Water, and any other major water authority or chemical company or the like that needs um, industrial componentry for their plant or their, or their storage facility. Um, the Brockman team is about 150 staff. Um, it's a growing business. You know, all of our businesses took um, some difficult times over the, the pandemic or the COVID period. We, we were a traditional business that had to um, manage our way through that period, which was very, very difficult. Um, we took the view that uh, we wanted to come out of it in a better position to rebound. Um, wasn't easy uh, for me. You've probably heard that from many CEOs, a very challenging time. You never knew what tomorrow would hold, whether it would be a uh, an opportunity or or something you had to deal with to to maintain your business, but we've come out of it in a good place with um you know the opportunity now to scale up, and that's fundamentally the the, the story of EVZ. Now we've done a lot of things over the time, and I'll, I'll summarise those in a moment when I've finished talking through the businesses. So moving on to Siphon Systems, uh, Siphon Systems is a I suppose the leader not a leader, the leader in siphonic stormwater roof drainage systems. So it's a building products business. We produce the siphonic roof drainage systems in-house. We design them, model them for every different type of building. We produce the componentry in-house in and we um, send it to site and it gets clipped up on the building and installed. And it's a very specialist type of roof drainage system and it is over, over time um, and, and we'll continue to replace what we call traditional graphic gravity type drainage for buildings. And um, it's very much more efficient. Uh, it's, it can save a lot of in-ground civil construction works, can save money for the building, can be a better outcome for the building owner. And, you know, we're traditionally on the, the more complex, more significant uh, buildings where the asset owner will like a greater assurance that he's not going to get stormwater or flooding damage and uh, and understands the, the metrics and the benefits of having you know, the flexibility to maybe re recycle water, whether it's going to tanks or detention, the like, much more flexibly with our system. So, you know, we've a, <clears throat> it suits any building from about two storeys or a five metre roof line or higher. And typically it's applied to shopping centres, warehouses, factories, stadiums, offices, apartment buildings. And in Melbourne, oh, sorry, in Australia, um, the head headquarters in Melbourne, but in Australia, we'd have between 80 and 90% market share. Um, I'd say that gravity roof drainage on complex large buildings is probably down below 50% now. And so we've still got quite a lot of market share to go, particularly in the northern parts. Sydney market is a, is a place where I think we can grow. Um, significantly, Melbourne market is pretty well done. And as you move north where the rainfall is higher, rainfall intensities are higher and... Um, and uh, 
the pipe sizes therefore get bigger and the system size gets bigger and more complex, um, you know, into Asia and the like, it's much more useful. And, uh, you know, there we're probably about 70% market share. So we've shared the market with one other party in Asia. And I think we're, we're making better headway than they are and we're a stronger and more quality business. And uh, in Australia, there's a couple of very small competitors. So moving on to tank industries, it's our newest member of the group. Um, brought in and we've acquired this business because we think we can add value to it as a business that uh, needed some a bit of improvement and um, and a bit of growth and an opportunity I think we've um, we've paid a nominal sum for this business it's turned over about between four and 11 10 9 million over the last five years um, it's at the lower end of that scale at the moment and we think we can add a lot of value to this business by bringing it in and effectively it's it, fits into our group of building products businesses, which we think will um, grow over time as we find the right avenues and the right businesses to clip into that space. And um, we think there's a great opportunity for water efficiency and water related uh, business in the building product space. Um, we think the tank industries and the team there have come on. They're very enthusiastic to be part of our group. And uh, we're going through the integration and transition process at the moment. So what they do is they build, and you can see on the screen there, they build fire water tanks. Those two there are actually on a site that Brockman worked on at, at Melbourne Airport. So we, you know, we've got a lot of complementary clients between Brockman and Siphon and Tank Industries. All of almost all of Tank Industries clients deal with our company in another way. So it's very very uh, beneficial for us to effectively bring the synergies. Um, uh, they, there's tanks used for fire water, they're used for cold water domestic, they're used for other water storage, chemical and, and process water, and they're also used for storm water, storm water detention. Um, uh, if when in urban areas where the building needs to hold its storm water and then slowly re reduce it, release it to the urban area. So, you know, a good business, um, certainly will be um, a growing business over time. and. And with the benefits of the back office of Siphon, the front office of Siphon and Brockman selling its wares and the salespersons in tank industries, it just allows us to expand our, our building product space. And, um, you know, that'll go through, I think, a transition and an investment phase for the first three to four months. And then we expect it to be quite a revenue, um, earning some revenue accretive to the group uh, in the second half. But significant investment. We, you know, the EVZ model has to be laid over that business, and we're going through that process right now. And um, it's time and, and energy intensive, and um, you know the the rewards will come once that phase is over. And our business in the um, energy sector is TSF Power. So we service, maintain, sell uh, generators, re renovate generators, uh, sell spare parts, just about everything you can do in what we call the biogas industry or the waste gas, re renewable waste gas industry. So gas that comes from uh, sewage street works, sewage, the process wastewater processing, um, landfill, um, coal mines, um, agricultural budget, biogest dynamic processes, Etc. Many, many different forms of where biogas comes from is captured. Its ozone depleting potential is reduced significantly by turning it into carbon dioxide and water uh, through the combustion process and produces electricity. And that electricity is, and uh, you can see that there's a there's a five unit uh, plant there. That I've got a little photo of um, that electricity can either be used behind the meter that is on a plant so if you've got a large plant and you've got a source of biogas you can use the electricity or the power on that site and uh, reduce your power bills possibly to zero and you can export some as well or you can export all of that power into the grid and uh, get a return on it and so there's different models and different modeling we can do for our clients to optimize their return or optimize the use of that power but also optimize the efficiency of the creation of electricity from the biogas and keep the engines running, get the plants running, provide operational support and the like. So TSF Power is a, a smaller business, but good, it's nicely growing at sort of 20 to 30% per year. Um, and it's a nice little profitable business that we expect to be able to clip on some acquisitions onto some infill acquisitions in years to come. So we've got our eye on a number of businesses, a number of sectors where we'd like to bring businesses in if they fit and where we can add value by bringing them in by 
putting the EVZ layer, layer of management over it or the EVZ systems, or just really it's a market um, synergies or backup or, or other synergies across our business. So we see TSF Power as something that will be a great little, little place to bring other businesses in that sector in the re renewable power space as Australia and the world go through the energy transition. Okay, so this is the span of our business at the moment, principally Southeast Asia. We expect to add a couple of, principally Southeast Asia and Australia, so we, we expect to add a couple more um, dots, if you like, on the map in Southeast Asia in the next few, in the next few months to a year as the world or that part of the world opens up after the pandemic. Um, we expect also to uh, continue to grow our team. So just, um, you know, this is just, just talking more widely about EVZ. You know, we've got um, uh, about, uh, about 100 staff have joined EVZ in, the, in this year. So there's been a lot of onboarding, uh, a lot of uh, development, uh, uh, hiring costs, uh, a, lot of, a lot of expense in efficiency and training and improving the efficiency of the business over that time. So we'd expect that uh, the investments we're making in this first half and in the, in the return from the pandemic in the, in the first, in the last second half of 22 and the first half of 23 will play out in the 2023 calendar year and 2024 uh, FY second half, FY23 and FY24, significant investment to bring 100 staff on return from the pandemic and we, and uh, you know, redevelop and replace your staff in the right positions and the like with these businesses. So we expect that will, will play out in those time, future time frames. Um, so this is a sort of a metric of our business that we watch well, uh, revenue backlog. This is the amount of contracted work in the business. You can see as you come out of the pandemic and return to normal, you'd say, there you can see how it started to fall away in March 2020. It already fallen a little bit. And then you can see the boost coming through for new ex infrastructure and ex um, investment programs coming on in the in kind of the year 22, March, June there. And I've, I've just reported to the market that in end of September, we're about that same level, just over $100 million with a revenue backlog. So that gives us a, a revenue outlook number for the future. It tells us the stability of our revenue um, going forward, that's one of the metrics we watch. Well, obviously, every every um, every week, but we report it formally to our our um, through our management reports every month. Well, I'd say uh, that that you know, FY twenty three, FY twenty four look quite strong from a revenue point of view. Our um our work is to convert that as much as I can going forward into earnings. Um, as we scale up, you know, there's always an investment phase as you scale up and then you get to release the earnings um, as their efficiency improves and as those people come on. So we'd say that, you know, revenue outlook is to at least 30% greater than 22. Um, good high record backlog, stable base workload, further growth can be brought from that, from that base. Uh, we expect that, you know, the 100 new hires, you know, we'll see um, uh, that work start to come through. It's already coming through the business at the moment. Um, and we'd expect over the, you know, give us a few more months to improve the improve the efficiency of our people and the onboarding costs and the like to have uh, um, come down a little bit, normalise a little. We'll start to see some better earnings coming through in the second half and, and from there on. Um, we cover most of our just to talk about inflation because it's right around the markets. Mate, we cover our all of our material costs and the like to have trade cover and hedge contracts with the material costs and the like. So, you know, we we don't sign a contract to do any work or the like. Um, our labour's hedged on EBA agreements and internal internal hiring agreements, and our material price rises are covered on ninety percent of our contract expenses. We there's only a couple of parts of the contracts right down the other end of each contract, a couple of years away that we don't hedge, but they're very small components of the overall thing. So we don't see any significant impact of inflation. The, the cost um, that we would see that has been more um, significant than I think is the, as a result of the economy is really the, the transition. And I think if you go, I think I saw a post on the, on a cafe recently I walked into said, um, Australia is understaffed. And that's true. You know, we've seen 
I think if you have seen, have bought, I've walked down a shopping strip in the last couple of weeks or into a Bunnings. I think they're all asking for staff that simply just aren't there. We hadn't seen any issue getting new staff until just recently. We're starting to see the thinner end of that. So really, I just keep things moving here because I know we've got time to keep. This is the investment thesis. You know, we're good. I've got balance sheet strengths. We've uh, paid off all our debt. We have a zero debt company as the 30th of June. Uh, sorry, 30th of September, my, my mistake. Uh, we still carry a bonding facility or a performance or a performance guarantee facility with the bank, but we have no term debt, no cash debt. Uh, that's been achieved. That's a great outcome for EVZ after um, roughly 15 or so years of high levels of debt. And our teams work very, very diligently to get that down to zero. Got a strong pipeline and opportunities. Uh, we're increasing activity coming as Asia comes back on stream more slowly than Australia and the, as the workers return from their home country into Southeast Asia for the growth period and the and the and the and the build of the um, infrastructure there. Um, we've got a highly skilled workforce. We've attracted a, about a hundred staff over the last year. Uh, those expenses and a transition to efficiency will be coming in the next few months. And the biggest um, transition for for EVZ is to growth and scale. So scaling up to be north of a hundred million dollars with a turnover per annum and uh, growing future from there in future financial years. So really, I'll, I'll just run through these very quickly, given times of short. Um, I said Brockman's a growing business, likely to be $60 million or so uh, this year from the sort of around $40 million base. It's got a great program there that we're working through as part of a government supported program to increase the amount of diesel storage on, on land. Uh, it's a program where the government's investing 50% of all project costs to increase the amount of fuel storage on uh, Australian soil because we were very, very low and had a significant exposure to a fuel shock. It's called the BADSP program, Building Australia's Diesel Storage Program. And it's about a $520 million program, which the government's footing $260 million of that bill. And those assets will be built um, this year. And we're building a couple of them already over ne in the next two financial years. Um, this is a typical project we've done the last couple of years, very large terminal, uh, building the tanks on the far right there and just continue expanding the distribution as the as the um, economy changes. We build uh, terminals to suit the distribution of fuel needs for Australia. Um, a siphon, pretty stable business, just generally growing and the economic changes has been most of the change for those divergence from the $20 million number, but now with tank industries and with uh, returning to, to, to uh, you know, strong economic times after the pandemic, we see those numbers increasing by 10 or 12%. And in, in uh, Asia and about 15% in Australia. And I would expect Asia to come back much more strongly in the second half. This is a typical, as a large project for um, Siphon in, in Asia. Typical, we do all of the landmark projects across Asia. And um, you know, this is TRX or Tunrasic Exchange in KL, a whole lifestyle precinct for the, for the area. And TSF Power, we're seeing, you know, 30% increase. You can see, unfortunately, there in 21, the, the impact of the pandemic, but back on the game, <clears throat> north of well north of $8 million in FY23. Um, it'll be, and it's a good little business that's run very, very well and um, a growing market share there. And uh, we'd expect the growing market share to continue over the next one or two years. And it's a typical project, you know, a, a wastewater treatment plant so the biogas from that turned into electricity and run and provide that electricity or that power to that entire plant to run it and uh, reduce the intake of electricity from the grid. So really that's, um, I think, summarises where we're at at the moment, um, very much uh, building business and we expect to um, expect to continue that journey now with a very strong balance sheet and opportunity to grow and bring in more businesses that suit us. Thanks. Okay. We've uh, got two questions from the audience. I'm just going to tackle the first one. Uh, anybody living on the East Coast of Australia, the frequency of extraordinary rainfalls won't have escaped them. Uh, so as a result, are you seeing increasing, I guess, inbound inquiry for siphon type products to, um, I guess, ret retrofit maybe onto existing buildings? Uh, yes, we do. So, um, the asset owners that like us most are the ones that have critical processes. So you know, I can't say company names, but let's say big food processes will have large 
um, manufacturing warehouses or factories or the like. Yes, we do quite a lot of those um, where uh, the, the system's been under designed originally when the building might have been built 20 or 30 or 40 years ago um, and retrofitting. And it's quite a job to retrofit over an existing process area. And so, yes, we're doing two of those at the moment uh, where we're retrofitting over, um, uh, let's say, live processes in uh, manner food manufacturing and the like. So, yes, we do see that. And we also see um, <clears throat> shopping centres that were built you know, same 20, 30, 40 years ago, um, coming online and suggesting that they don't want their um, trading re reduced any further from the flooding and the like. See, we are seeing quite a few of those. <clears throat> it is a large step because retrofitting roofs and drainage and, and reconfiguring the entire system is um, complex and expensive. But ultimately, you know, the it's a, it's a relatively small price to uh, having a major flood inside your building and the damage and the loss of trade and the like. So, yeah, we're seeing those. Uh, we do a couple of those a year normally, and we'd expect those to increase. But certainly we'd say what we're seeing is, um, you know, the standards for rainfall protection, let's call it, from from uh, inside, from internal areas are increasing. We're seeing um, clients with... Um, let's say there's been a boom in warehouses, as you can understand, the online shopping boom and the like, particularly across Asia with manufacturing um, in increasing and uh, the need for new factories and the like up there, really uh, much more big focus on um, high quality building product, I call these siphonic systems. And um, yeah, we'd expect that that uh, will continue and we see siphon as a or already a very consistent high performer. We see that growing um, and more and more over the years. And then uh, another question just on the, the revenue backlog. Um, how long does that, uh, on average, across the, you know, Siphon business, Brockman, Tank Industries, TVZ, take to convert to cash? Is it kind of somewhere in that 12 to 24 months? So that like 100 million should kind of come in through the business in revenue and cash generation over the next kind of two financial years or somewhere around there. Is that kind of fair to fair way of thinking it rough rule? Yeah. yeah, that's a pretty simple uh, analysis that's quite accurate. Um, yeah. So there's a number of different elements that and, so, and backlog is a complex science when you get right down to the nitty gritty, but because um, there's revenue contracts that we have that renew every month and so that just gets added and so we you know so fundamentally if you're turning over 100 million dollars a year you, 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 you the, the take out of the 100 million dollars is roughly nine million dollars a month if you're if you're eight to nine million dollars a month you're winning about the same but there's revenue contracts that we or contracts we have that bring revenue every month so there's a base load of revenue that just re reoccurs so yeah 100 million dollars would say revenue stability for at least one year likely to be two um, but as uh, the economy continues to bring new opportunities and we um, and we see them and uh, you know they're in a good commercial arrangement for us and we're careful about those sorts of things you know we would see that that's replaced almost consistently and we don't expect that replacement of revenue backlog to change markedly we might drop you know 10 or 20 million dollars in backlog and then we'll pick up a larger job and we'll come back to 90 100 110 million dollars so i expect that there's one to two years work there look at it. it's a nice place to be it's also a nice place to be able to be able to be more choosy about the contracts you take and also about the and more timely about negotiating better quality outcomes with your clients so that you can get a better service to them and you, your team can have a better environment to work in and then just on tank industries, um, you know, once that's kind of integrated into the wider EVZ uh, family, in terms of margins for that business, should it be kind of something similar to what we see in Brockman, given the the kind of, you know, underlying um, operational businesses seem fairly similar? So should they kind of have kind of similar margins or is tank industries yeah. that little bit even more specialized than what you do in Brockman? No, it's um, <clears throat> it's a bit less specialized because there are a few other competitors around, but, it, but because of the siphon um, opportunity, we can change the offering to the marketplace um, by having it integrate into our siphon systems or integrating siphon systems within the tank or outside. So it has a real advantage with siphon, but 
I, look, the modelling we've done suggests that it's going to be of the order of the margins that Siphon Australia run, which are between uh, between six and seven percent, seven maybe seven and a half percent, and on a good year. So we would expect it's a bit better than Brockman. Um, it's building product overall. It's got it's most of its work, most of the labour or cost is pre-site. The site install is relatively a short term uh, and uh, most of the work is in the design phase and the manufacturing of all the componentry and then the assembly on site is a smaller arm. So we, the modelling we've done with the business suggests it's more in the margin range of Siphon Australia okay. and it will work very closely with Siphon Australia to you know, grow its market share and, and, and change the, the diametrics of the competition there with by offering a product that really doesn't exist. It's an integrated siphon tank or an integrated siphon system tank. So there's some elements there that will bring it to market that um, will give us a bit of a differentiator. Okay, great. Uh, Scott, we're going to have to leave it there because we're just up on time. Uh, thanks very much for coming back in and uh, giving us an update on all things ZVZ. And uh, yeah, we'll keep, uh, keep an eye out for further announcements on the ASX over the next couple of months. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening. And if you could please stop sharing your screen, Scott. Thank you. As I do know, we have John Kelly from Atoma Diagnostics uh, standing by. Uh, John, if you want to start sharing your presentation, I'll let you know when I can see it uh, coming up. Yeah, we're just uh, pulling it up now. Thank you for uh, your time. Um, here with uh, Will Suter, our CFO. Okay. So having a bit of trouble with the share screen, Mark, I'll just um, close the document and reopen it, see if that helps. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm just checking you've got the permission to share you should have. So let's just see to reopen. Okay. Let's try again. Mm. Have yeah. to do it this way. Is that okay? Uh, that all right? Yeah, if you just go to full screen now, uh, Will, I think we should be good to get there. Okay. Good, we're there. Okay, I'll take it away, John, whenever you're ready. All right, well, Mark, I'll kick off. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, nice to be here, and thanks for hosting us again, Mark. Um, I'm just going to cover some of the highlights from the quarterly that we released last week, and then I'll hand over to John. John's going to take you through a little bit about I guess taking a step back in terms of the, you know, the way Atomo approaches the market and also to talk a little bit about um, our plans for, for FY23. For those of you that don't know the company, we are Atomo Diagnostics. We listed in April 2020, so coming up for two and a half years post-listing. Uh, the company makes uh, devices to make rapid testing easier for the end user, so integrating functionality and simplifying the processes. And we also uh, make finished products themselves for rapid testing. So um, we have an HIV self-test approved in, in Australia and internationally with World Health and, and CE marked in Europe. Uh, and we also have a, a COVID-19 test that we've been selling in Australia. So um, there's obviously more information about the background of the business on our website. But jumping right into the quarterly, um, to summarise, we had a good quarter to get the year underway. We received uh, about 1.4 million in cash receipts from customers, which was uh, predominantly HIV rapid test sales and another close to half a million in COVID-19 um, rapid antigen test sales. Uh, early in the quarter, we saw a bit of a pickup in orders on, on the COVID side, but they started to slow down as the quarter unfolded. Um, and we're seeing predominantly uh, employers, government agencies and others putting responsibility for COVID testing back in the hands of the individual. So. Um, so some of the corporate customers we had have, have slowed down in terms of ordering, but we've continued to make some self-test sales as, as the quarter's unfolded. And, you know, we'll see how things progress um, as we move towards the end of the calendar year. In terms of revenue for the quarter, close to $900,000, roughly split between HIV self-test sales and COVID-19 uh, rapid test sales. Uh, and pleasingly, we saw a return of ordering from our uh, OEM customer, NG Biotech, who buys our Pascal platform for their um, blood-based pregnancy test. So they put in an initial order in, at the, uh, in, in the quarter and then as an order subsequent to a quarter in uh, close. So they've now ordered about 146,000 devices from us so far this year. And it's good to see some of that OEM business coming back as 
our existing and new customers move you know, beyond COVID and get back to their core business. Uh, around 100,000 HIV tests sold. We're continuing to work with our partner Beatrice in international markets where they are our exclusive distributor, particularly for global health. Um, they've registered the tests in, uh, in a number of countries globally and we're now starting to see more repeat orders, uh, which is pleasing, um, particularly from some of the Southeast Asian countries. Um, and, and that's really what we're trying to build out is a portfolio of countries ordering on a repeat basis um, and, and growing the number of countries. So we're growing both uh, the number of tests sold to each country and the number of countries that we're selling to. So that's, you know, that's been interrupted by COVID, but it seems that we're, um, you know, we're getting back on track there and, and things are starting to pick up. As I mentioned, the COVID business in Australia is very much you know, in the hands of public policymakers and in the hands of um, decisions being made by employers. Um, most people will obviously have seen that generally people have taken a step back from widespread testing, um, but we are ready to respond in the event that testing starts to pick up again. And as I mentioned, um, pleasing to see NG Biotech in particular starting to order again. Uh, they registered the product in Brazil and that's where some of the, um, the new demand is, is coming from. Uh, a very large market there and they're quite optimistic about that. Um, as I say, they have ordered over 140,000 units so far this, uh, this half. Um, but they're indicating that they think those numbers could be substantially higher as the year unfolds and, you know, Brazil and other countries come online. Uh, just a quick reminder in terms of annual sales revenue, um, uh, you know, just to show where we've come from, um, you know, FY19 around half a million dollars in revenue, FY20 a bit over 5 million, uh, close to 7 million in 21 and, and, um, and over, you know, close to 14 million, around 14 million in uh, 22. Uh, and importantly, we've been really careful with our cash um, and finished the year with 11, uh, finished the quarter, I should say, with 11.25 million in cash on hand and debt free. Just to highlight the key value drivers that we see within the company and you know, what we think um, isn't necessarily being recognised in the market at the moment, um, as the sector generally is you know, under, some, under some pressure and we're expecting to see that turn around. Um, you know, just to remind everybody, this, this approach that Atomo takes to rapid diagnostics is not an approach that's been taken by, by other diagnostic companies. And John's going to talk some more about that today. Um, as I say, we finished the, the, the year and the quarter and the first quarter of this year with um, you know, a strong balance sheet and plenty of runway. Um, we've got some committed core investors and a very experienced board and management team um, to manage the business as we move into 23. Really importantly, we spent um, a chunk of the capital we raised at IPO in building out our production capacity, and that's now done. And so really we're in a position to monetize that with growth in sales without significant capital associated with that. We're obviously still continuing to invest in, in R&D, and John will talk a little bit about that, um, and core areas of, of capital, but predominantly that the spend is, is done and we can, you know, we can ramp up to up to 18 million units of production with our existing capacity. Uh, Obviously, the pandemic's changed the way people think about rapid testing, the way and, and just broad awareness and understanding across all the key stakeholders from, you know, the end consumer right back through to regulators and government and everyone in between. People know what rapid testing is. They can see how it can be used and how it can be useful. And that uh, change in landscape has, um, you know, is, it positions Atomo really well to, um, to provide its products into that market. And, you know, we haven't just started doing this as a result of the pandemic. Our platforms have been in development for a you know, many, many years. And, and that's, I guess, vindicated by the fact that we've been able to secure customers who want to buy those products and also secure regulatory approvals, um, you know, with organisations like the World Health Organisation, which is, you know, a long and difficult process. And again, just to remind everyone, there's innovation here and there's patents um, that sit behind uh, the products and the markets that we're, you know, that we're approaching uh, a significant investment in R&D has led to, you know, to that to that portfolio of patents and, and protected IP, as well as the know-how in terms of how to actually um, build and and um, and I guess bring these, you know, these assets to market. Thanks, yeah, and I, I think what what Will's talking about is, is a unique approach that we've taken to the market, and, and that's really looking at the end user and really basing the whole experience around the end user. And that was based on the fact that the, the chemistry used in rapid testing was developed and functional and, and fully commercialized, but the end user really hadn't been considered in the delivery of those products. So, you know, when we bring products to market, we want our products to make the incumbent technology look obsolete. And we think when you compare 
the bits in box format with the Atomo solutions. We've done that successfully. And, and that's really been through delivering products that look and feel consumer friendly, uh, removing complexity, removing the need for errors, uh, users to really judge whether they've done things correctly. And that makes users feel confident. Uh, they make less errors, they get better results. And that makes the regulators and clinical uh, infrastructure happy as well. But really, the, for success in consumer health, making the user happy is, is paramount because that leads to repeat use and recommendations to others. And I think with our first range of platforms to market the HIV test, we've done that well. So how do we do that? We really look at the existing products, how they're used, how they're packaged, the whole life cycle of those products. And we identify any area where we think we can remove a step or we can make that step integrated or mitigate errors associated with that step. And then we drill down into each of those opportunities and deliver uh, a level of functionality that addresses those and we then engineer them into a, a finished solution and that allows us to really understand the needs of the user in a way that I think a lot of diagnostics companies don't really take the time to understand and that I think reflects our our sort of consumer health focus when we came to this market and that allows us to develop some really valuable proprietary know-how around what needs to happen when to make this this test procedure bulletproof and it's allowed us to develop then some, some quite elegant engineered solutions that we've been able to patent at, at high levels, how to make steps happen in a, certain, in a certain sequence so the user doesn't have to think about it, how to automatically collect and deliver very controlled volumes of blood, how to deliver controlled volumes of sample, and to do that fully integrated into an elegant solution. Uh, makes it from the user's perspective very easy to use, but it means it's a it's a fairly comprehen comprehensively engineered solution. And one that we're now seeking to expand beyond blood, we've proven to the market now we can make the world's best home test blood platforms, and we're now moving into other applications like swab testing, and then beyond that, uh, saliva and at-home blood collection. So this just talks about that iterative approach to design. We look at some form functions, some foamies, we get some functionality, established we then try and integrate that onto a cassette get it working and then once we've done that we look at improving usability usually improving performance and then the last phase is really that optimization for high scale manufacturing uh, low cost assembly and that gets us to a scalable product that meets uh, the requirements not only of users but but manufacturing and, and regulatory requirements as well and that allows us to scale these platforms at low cost and keeps us cost competitive in markets where the pricing is critical and in markets where the pricing is not as critical, it allows us to uh, return a very significant margin back to the business. And we think we've done that successfully. The user feedback on the product has been, has been extremely positive. We have uh, users who would rather pay for this product than use the free one that they're being given in the UK. Uh, and that allows us to deliver a level of performance that's not only keeping the user happy, but also delivering much better clinical performance. And that's allowed us to get regulatory approvals that other blood test kits have not been able to get. And that's really where I think the value is for the business moving forward to expand that range of products beyond blood into consumer health testing applications. And that's a market that up until the pandemic was niche, it was small, and it wasn't one that allowed the bigger diagnostics companies to get too excited. But obviously the pandemic has transformed the market the amount of effort, focus, and money going into, and particularly the US market for home testing is very significant. And our platforms are ideally placed uh, to deliver solutions. And we're very excited about the types of arrangements that we can deliver in the market because the user feedback that we can bring to market is, is, is second to none. And I think the larger diagnostics companies and the e-commerce companies really do value this ability to make the user happy with a product that's fit for purpose. And that's really our, our key differentiator and I think one that the market here in Australia maybe hasn't fully appreciated because that transition to home testing is is is, is less advanced here although it is I think inevitable that the market will transition more to consumer focused e-commerce based delivery and, and healthcare is one of the last bastions of 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 non online uh, delivery but I think that that's now changed and that's where I think we're going to see some valuable contracts and, and arrangements coming to market. As mentioned previously, we, we delivered a range of blood tests to market. We 
learned during the pandemic that a lot of up, upside was non-blood. So we've worked very hard to bring a swab test device to preliminary verification. We've got some really promising results on that device in terms of performance and usability, but also some very encouraging feedback from the diagnostics companies that we've showed it to. And we're looking to move forward uh, through the rest of this FY with a full commercialization program. We have been able to demonstrate on our blood platform best in class for HIV. We are uh, keen to see our partners coming back to market on the platform. Uh, we did pivot into COVID really because a lot of our partners on blood platforms moved off to focus on COVID and there was a, a hiatus on new development pipeline opportunities that we were working on. Uh, we're, we're seeing not only a, a resurgence in, in inbound interest, but I think more focus now on home testing broadly within the market. And I think that gives us good prospects for a, a range of contracts in FY23 and 24 as, as the market continues to appreciate the value that the platforms bring and the reputation and awareness of our products, particularly in the US, is, is improved by our commercial activities there and having a couple of people now focused on growing that international business for us. Uh, we also know from the pandemic that the uh, apps uh, were pre-pandemic difficult to get approval for from regulators, but now the, the pendulum has swung the other way. Regulators are very interested in being able to deliver home-based apps because they not only improve usability by delivering more user-friendly instructions than a, than a paper-based IFU, but more, more importantly, they can control the results interpretation, they provide traceability, they provide data uplinks back to healthcare providers, insurance payers and employers. And that allows for the reimbursement funding cycle to be more robust in home markets. And we've gone to a lot of trouble to develop an app that we're now in the process of commercializing uh, primarily for self-test use. And we continue to work with a couple of manufacturers to make sure that a version of our cassette is compatible with their plug-in readers so that we can also continue to target the point of care doctor office market that's also expanding into pharmacy testing as well. And really we're now seeing, I think the fruits of that, that labor over the last year, we're starting to look at uh, some pilot programs with some new manufacturers that are interested in assessing their assays on our platform uh, with a view to getting uh, an improved level of usability in their product. And, and I think ultimately consumer OTC home test approvals and we're expecting to see agreements now come, come to, to market over the period uh, FY23 and beyond as we deliver those contracts. And as Will mentioned, we are at scale. We can make up to 18 million cassettes per annum now without further CapEx investment. So we expect to be able to uh, see, see, see revenue scale without a, a corresponding proportional increase in our, in our OPEX and CapEx. And that means we're, we're leveraged to growth now quite, quite cost effectively. And the strategy for 23 and beyond is to continue to scale up our HIV business. We, uh, that's a, a, a vending machine at a university in Australia where the university is starting to promote uh, safe, safe sexual health practices and HIV screening is a, a large part of that. We have an approval for our professional use HIV tests in Europe and we're looking now to roll out a distribution network and launch that product in this FY and continue to see continued growth in other, in other markets as Viatris continue to register in, in, in key markets. We're, we're now registered in, in over 40 countries. Uh, we're continuing to really focus on scaling up the OEM business. Uh, we've got a pipeline of interested partners that are assessing the technology and we're working with them to bring them onto the platforms. We're looking to push into adjacent markets such as animal health. Uh, and establish reseller partnerships where companies that do a lot of new assay development for market can offer our platform in that development program so that companies developing new tests can come to market directly onto our platform rather than having to launch a standard test and then, and then re-qualify on our platform as a, as a secondary activity. So all of that we think will continue to uh, deliver momentum to the business and we'll, we expect to see that revenue come through as we roll through 23 into 24. And we're very excited about the opportunities, both from an OEM partnering perspective, as well as uh, finished products that Atomo can now bring to market itself. Uh, that, that's a quick recap on, on our strategy moving forward. Happy to take, to take some questions now. 
Uh, thanks, John. Yeah, we've got two from the audience. Sorry. Uh, one is, um, I think, I think you know, it says, uh, when do you predict a company will begin to make a profit? I think a more broader question around that would be, you know, the end of the the kind of capex building and getting all the facilities up and running. Um, you know, what level of kind of, and I know it's down a bit to sales, mixed finished product versus o, versus OEM product, but. Um, you know where where is the kind of break even point uh, as we sit here today in t in terms of sales? Well, Mark, obviously we're not giving forecasts, but I guess people can have a look at the numbers and 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 make some estimates. And the point that John made that capex is largely complete and fully installed, um, and that opex doesn't need to rise significantly to to fill that production capacity. We've got a platform business, and we can grow that without needing to add significantly to, to OPEX. So with the OPEX running at less than a million a month and our gross margins in the 40 to 60% range, as you say, depending on the product mix, um, then you can, you can back calculate what number we need to make um, to, to break even from an operating perspective. Um, we did we were cash flow positive in Q3 of FY22. So that obviously gives people another data point to look at in terms of um, what we need to do to achieve that. And again, there are a lot of these um, opportunities out there. So predicting which of those plans to get us there is, is difficult, but you know, the idea is to have a portfolio approach to lots of different customers across OEM, as well as bringing through our own finished products and finding partners to support that activity. Um, and so when you look at that on an overall portfolio basis, you know, we can see a pathway to profitability. I, th I think the other point to note is now that the market, particularly in the US, is, is very focused on opportunities in consumer health and home testing. I think the value of our technology in those market segments is, is increased and therefore our ability to look to secure development and licensing support on the way through to revenue is, is more feasible than it was pre-pandemic when our technology was unproven and we didn't have the the, the regulatory approvals and the market credentials to, to, to secure those markets. And I think, you know, the deal with Access Bio where we were able to back in minimum take or pay sort of evidence is that. And that's, I think, something we're continuing to focus on. So I think revenue in the medium term can also be augmented by, by uh, non-product sale revenue as we get through to market. And uh, this is maybe one for offline, or maybe you can direct them to uh, press releases or the website. But uh, um, evidence for the claim of being best in class in HIV, the, they're saying any links here. Is there specific stuff on the Atoma Diagnostic website you can you can point them to, Will or John? Or, um, yeah, I mean, in some of our previous presentations, yeah, in some of our previous presentations, we've uh, We've talked about independent verified usability that has been delivered as part of the CE mark approval and also the World Health pre-qualification. Those levels of usability are, are best in class when compared to other uh, self-test formats or platforms in terms of ease of use. I think also when we look at our device compared to standard kits that are the, the main sort of competitor in the market, our, our, our professional use user preference is over 90%. So that again, I think talks to uh, what we consider best in class recognition for the usability that we deliver. Um, and I know uh, uh, you've uh, been very active on the conference scene now that that has, has reopened. Um, what's been the major kind of feedback you, you've got uh, from these conferences around the HIV business in particular, because I saw Gilead Sciences, um, you know, were very bullish on their HIV uh, kind of business. I know it's, you know, they're on more on the drug side, but, you know, there seems to be a lot of interest, at least on their side on, you know, HIV drugs, new drug testing, uh, new bringing new treatments to market, you know, the HIV sector seems to have you know, reignited a bit in in terms of um what uh, companies are looking to invest in and and, and trial new uh, treatments in. Yeah, no, I I think that the HIV funding more broadly and HIV focus took a hit through the pandemic as kind of governments and public health you know swung away from HIV to deal with COVID, and we saw some of that. You know, some of the the, the forecasts from our partners in global health 
were not met, and that's in large part because of a slowdown in in country registration and and funding focus from from key players. That to to your point has has reversed, and we are now seeing a, a resurgence in 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 tender opportunities and drugs to treat downstream uh, diagnosis. And I think you know. Fiatris, our partner in LMIC markets, is, is one of the leaders in the supply of HIV medicine to global health. And I think that was why they were interested in getting exclusive access to our tests so that they could, you know, help diagnose people and then obviously, you know, get them into treatment where they have a, an economic and, and, and sort of a diagnostic to drug transition model. Uh, so I think that's one that we think is, is very valuable. And we're actively looking at other applications where we think our end customer slash partner could be a pharmaceutical company rather than, than a healthcare provider or, or public health provider. Because for HIV is not the only opportunity for us to deliver a, a diagnostic as part of a transition to, to treatment program. And, and obviously, pharmaceutical companies are very attracted by being able to capture new customers. So we think that is something for certain applications very exciting. And Mark, just just in terms of the response we've been getting to um, specific, you know, activities, marketing activities for HIV, that's predominantly been focused on Australia, where we obviously control the distribution of our own product. And what we're looking to do is establish Australia as as essentially, obviously, a you know, profit centre in its own right and a, and a good source of revenue, but as a pilot program for what an HIV self test in a developed market looks like. So we've been working um, through a number of different approaches to that across social media, you know, in-person attendance at these conferences and things. And then obviously the TGA changing the rules around advertising and, and pharmacy sales, you know, relatively recently, um, we've been clearly, clearly we've been targeting that market. So, you know, a salesperson whose responsibility is to go and, and, and build that pharmacy market. Um, the marketing team focused on getting awareness out there in, in terms of brand awareness being really, really well received. You know, there was a big expo on over the weekend here where, um, where we had a booth and, you know, there's just there's just growing awareness of these sorts of um, ways of managing, you know, exposure to sexual health that, that people just didn't know about. And Atomo is the only approved HIV self-test. So what we're looking to do is prove that concept here in Australia, grow the numbers as much as we can in a relatively small market and then take that model into developed markets. And that's obviously helpful in our engagement with potential partners, particularly for North America, where we're looking for go-to-market go partners to help us with that sort of thing. To give you an example... You know, we weren't selling anything to pharmacies six months ago because we weren't allowed to. Um, we're now seeing the number of pharmacies uh, growing and also the number of pharmacies making repeat orders and larger orders growing as well. Now, they're not big numbers yet, but it's a good example of what happens when, you know, the, the rules change and that's what's happened globally. And when you're not able then to focus your, your efforts on growing those markets. And as I say, it's a great blueprint for what we could be doing in North America and, and other opportunities to really grow in, in you know, European and developed markets in particular. Yeah. I, and I think in regards conferences in North America, our focus has been to uh, secure OEM partnerships because they give us scale. We don't have to pay for the go-to-market costs for regularly and clinical with partner products. And there it's really been a case of generating awareness that Atomo has this solution, that it does have regulatory approvals, that it is at scale, that the offering is de-risked because pre-pandemic, we didn't really have that, that, that credibility because we didn't have the sales, we didn't have all the regulatory approvals. And then obviously during the pandemic, everybody was focused on COVID and we couldn't travel. So really now it's been a case of getting the awareness up so that we can have that funnel of inbound inquiries from people that, want to find out more and we're now in the process of you know filtering through those and starting to turn around small builds of pilot sample product and evaluation activities that, that then you know we expect to lead to agreements and the good thing is we're talking to we're talking to all types of customers but we are getting more engagement with bigger companies than we were before the pandemic and I think that's because home testing is now of more interest to them than, than it was previously. Okay great. John, Will, we're just up on time there. We've got like about a, a minute to go. So I think I'll leave it there rather than uh, let's uh, then squeezing in a, a, another question that uh, would be difficult to give an answer to in, in, in 45 seconds or so. But thank you very much for, 
coming back in and, and giving us an update. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll hear from you uh, in the new year, uh, end of January, when uh, the, the next 4C comes out. All right, well, thank you for having us. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, John. Thanks, Will. And uh, I do know we have, waiting patiently in the wings, uh, Michael Cooper from Pure Foods Tasmania is joining us from Hobart. Uh, thanks, Michael, for joining us. Uh, thanks, Mark. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you okay. If you want to start sharing your presentation, yeah. I'll let you know when I can see it on screen here now. Cool. Can you see that there, Mark? Uh, it's just loading now, Michael. Uh, yeah, I can see it now. And if you just want to go to maybe full screen mode, uh, just so we can get a little bit bigger. Should be good now. It's full screen mine. Yeah, there we go. That's perfect. That? Thanks, Michael. Okay, thanks, Mark. Thank you. And thanks for the audience attending. It's um, PFT's first um, session with Mark as such. So um, thank you very much for having us aboard, Mark. Um, I just thought I'd run you through um, a little bit of history about PFT, um, where what we're here for and where we're going. Um, it's been a journey since uh, listing in April 2020 um, and been quite exciting, uh, quite exciting journey being based in Tasmania, um, providing premium foods and moving into beverages in the future. So in 2015, Pure Foods Tasmania was formed by a group of about 20 high net wealth investors. Um, and you can see, you can see on the screen there, we've got seven major brand names and five major companies which we actually own and operate. Um, the first acquisition in Australia, um, mainly it, held, it holds a couple of very high valued white label contracts, um, along with its um, homestead brand, which is a premium brand and market leader. Um, after that, we acquired the Woodbridge Smokehouse, which is a traditionally um, smokehouse based in uh, Woodbridge as such, which is about 45 minutes south of Hobart. And that's providing um, a smoking of Atlantic salmon and ocean trout. As you know, in Australia, the only place that it's actually farmed is Tasmania. So all the major growers, the three major growers are in Hobart um, and the Northwest, and we provide um, products through their system. Um, the products exported, a majority of that product is exported into Asia, um, would have a lot of success and growing through the independence throughout Australia. Um, the next acquisition was the Daily Potato Company, um, which is a, a value-add meals salad business. Um, basically, from a uh, farming family, they decided that their excess potatoes, they would value-add and moved into potato salads, cold slaws, um, meal solutions, and our signature product, uh, potato gravy, which I'll talk a bit more about later. Our next acquisition after that was, was Lord's plant-based cheese. Um, we know we really saw a big um, market swing into um, plant-based foods. Um, you know, a lot of the younger generation are looking to save the world with the environment and climate change is such a big thing. So plant-based foods have proven to be less harf, harsh on the environment. Um, then after that, we um, moved, extended our plant-based operation and moved into the cashew creamy. Um, the cashew creamy is plant-based ice cream. Um, it's ice cream made from cashews um, and other, other nuts. So that's been really successful for us. Um, the the plant-based ice cream category itself is, is growing very, very fast. You've probably seen in the supermarkets, there's, there's been a large expansion of brands from all the major brand holders have all moved into that space. Um, the product's exceptional. It's, um, it's really, really hard to even tell the difference. It's not dairy. So, you know, when I'll go back through FY22. You know, we've only been going for a bit over two and a half years. Um, you know, our first year, we grew revenue of, of close to over 50%. In the second year, we grew revenue of over 34%, as you can see, um, from, you know, 7.7 .7 million to 10.4. Um, the business has done a great job getting its distribution out, growing its customer base. Um, you know, we've, um, as I'll show you shortly, there's um, been significant growth in customers and, you know, just breaking up by brand and success we've had. Uh, the Tasmanian's um, Pate business grew to, to 4 million revenue um, that was launched on the base of a premium um, homestead range, which we moved into Woolworths nationally. Um, since then, we've added additional flavours to that and it continues to grow. Um, that product itself is market leader. Um, it's just been successfully arranged in going to Coles in the next three weeks nationally as well. So um, we're very proud of what we've been able to achieve with that product. Um, it's a premium product. Um, one thing is important 
that we recognise um, that we have we have brands across the value mainstream and premium space, um, which is really important considering there's a bit of inflation happening, as we all know. So we're able to have a product that fits within everyone's budget. The Daily Potato Company, um, that also grew very strongly uh, last point year at 37%. Um, that's pretty significant growth on the back of new ranging um, throughout the country through in independence and also um, the launch of the potato and gravy product, which is, um, we'll talk a bit more down the, down the track about that. Uh, Woodbridge Smokehouse, um, that's our um, smokehouse down at uh, Woodbridge, which I spoke about before, um, mainly large export business. That export business was um, sort of only just reopened again in the last three weeks into Hong Kong, which has been our largest customer. Um, as we know, Hong Kong was all shut pretty all tight because of COVID. Um, but that business itself has grown very, very strong last year. Um, we are still seeing growth opportunities there. Um, the whole price has grown significantly, so pricing has lifted. Um, demand has slowed uh, a little bit compared to what the run rate was from previous years, but we see the, the, the premium space where we will maintain and stay within that category. Um, our product is outstanding. It's smoked over traditional timber. Um, a lot of the other providers are, are smoking in automated smoke ovens, which makes a big difference to the flavour. The cashew creamy, um, yeah, massive growth, as you can see last year, it grew over a thousand percent. Although a small base, as you can see with the revenue there, it's, it's still growing significantly. Um, I think we're growing over 14 for the first quarter. We secured uh, range into Woolworths Metro stores and, and increased our distribution through independent stores throughout the country. We've got further MPD coming there with um, new larger one litre tubs coming shortly. Um, so we're moving to that tub market and, and be along in, alongside the mainstream guys. Um, also pretty exciting, we're, we're just installing a brand new uh, turnkey filling machine or filling line, if you want to call it that, which has taken 12 months to, to arrive, um, which finally has been commissioning as we speak today, which is quite exciting. Plant-based uh, cheese business, Lords, um, obviously grew as well really hard. Um, that's on the back of new distribution. Um, and that market continues to grow because a lot of people, you know, maybe one out of seven meals now is becoming a vegan offer. So we're seeing, seeing a lot of growth, especially amongst the younger generation. Um, and as I mentioned before, our customer base, you know, continues to grow, which is so important. If our customers can't access our products, um, there's, uh, there's no point. So, you know, 30% increase in customer base just in FY22 alone. So a bit of the highlights on, on quarter one. Um, so we... We were very successful cap raised during the quarter. We raised 5.95 million cash. Um, that was through a placement and a rights issue. Um, it was actually oversubscribed. So we were very, very happy with the result of that. Um, and it just sends a good signal that, you know, we have a lot of people that really support our growth and, and where we're going uh, and believe in our strategy. Um, you know, at the end of September, you know, we had 8.578 million in cash and unused um, facilities. So. Very, very strong balance sheet, um, which is which is great and allows us to continue with our MPD, continue to grow the business and, and support our future um, acquisition strategy. Tasmanian Paddy also, you know, it's forecast to grow by an additional $1 million this year, which is a massive growth, you know, $1 million on top of four. Um, that's based on some new contracts that have been um, secured um, and obviously the new Coles relationship as well. So we've also um, got some CapEx just going through with a, a brand new um, machine being installed in the next four weeks. Um, that equipment along with the cashew cream equipment was ordered over 12 months ago. Um, that's really going to improve our labour and um, reduce our cogs um, and, our, and our yields as well. So really looking forward to that. And of course, it's going to improve our um, packaging and recyclability, which is really, really important for the environment. Um, Woodbridge, is, as I mentioned before, Hong Kong just opened back up and we just received uh, another export order, which is great. It's the first time I've had since December. It's also very positive. So we're busy away making those large export orders as we speak. Um, the Cashew Creamery, you know, delivered, as mentioned, a great uh, result in the first quarter, still growing at 14% um, in this market. That's pretty good considering the challenges that people are having. So we're still seeing demand there. That's, that's been driven by, you know, obviously the, the relationship with Woolworths and the IGA stores. Um, the new equipment, as I mentioned before, is just actually being commissioned today. Um, you know, that's going to give us a capacity of well over 300% more. So that's super exciting. Um, the uh, As we relaunched our potato and gravy product into 100% um, recycled material, also during the quarter as well. So very, very busy quarter. Uh, we had a bit of a challenge with, um, with cabbage. So uh, we're unable to supply Woolworths with cabbage for our coleslaw. The rest of the country was in the same boat. So 
coal stores now back on the shelves where, or across the country um, because cabbage is now available. The recent floods in Victoria obviously affecting um, Victorian producers. So we've been, um, we've been lucky enough to still have local cabbages. So that's a great opportunity for us as well. So it's just a, a snapshot there of our new um, turnkey ice cream facility, which is just actually, as, as I speak, it's been commissioned. And that'll increase our capacity by over 300%, reduce our colds, uh, and also improve the quality of the product. Right. Give us flexibility for more MPD. So, as I mentioned before, you know this business was formed in 2015, and the strategy behind the whole business is to is to have premium Tasmanian food and beverages. Um, you know, Tasmania really is probably one of the hottest places you can be on the planet. Um, we're a long way away from any um, any major issues going on in the world, so uh, and a great place to 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 grow um, produce, of course, and, and we convene that great produce into great Tasmanian brands. So, super exciting. Just a, a slide there, I thought it was important, you know, it's all about having access, brands access to our customers. As you can see, you know, the customer base is growing dramatically. It's still growing now. Uh, we have 2,000 um, consumer access points and you can see our, our reach into the export markets as well. So we've got a very, very big distribution into all customer segments. You know, we do independence, we're distributors, major retail, we're in white label, we're in export and we're in food service as well. So, you know, we've got PNC to go, which is petrol and revenues, um, which we're just launching um, some SKUs to be able to present to them shortly. Um, you know, one of our signature projects, um, this project's been going for well over two and a half years, um, the famous potato and gravy product. Um, you'll, that product now is available on some independents. You'll be seeing it in um, major retail in the, in the sort of towards the end of November, early December. Um, we had a relaunch of some packaging, moving into recyclable packaging. I mean, this business itself is, you know, there's 90 million barbecue chickens sold um, in retail stores across the country. Um, so it's very, very big business. And, you know, if we can sort of pick up 1% of that, we'll be quite happy. Um, basically, you can buy a barbecue chicken um, and a potato and gravy and, and feed a family of four people. So it's obviously a value offer as well, but you can probably do the whole thing for just over $20. So very exciting. It's been quite a challenging project, um, but we are finally there. We also launched in the year, which are really exciting, um, space moving to frozen um, vegetables, as you can see, you know, rosemary and garlic and crispy duck fat, potato gravy and, and rosemary milli, you'll buy these in your freezer cabinet. You take them home, you can put them in your oven or your microwave. This is a brand new category for us. Um, and early indications, it's, it's going very, very well. And it's a premium space. So most of the um, frozen veggies have been sort of down the bottom end of the value chain. Um, we've come in at the sort of the high end of the value chain. Um, and we've seen a really good uptake. I mean, our product itself is 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 nearly um, as hand nurtured. It's very very good quality compared to the to the larger brands. Um, as I mentioned before, and our plant based business is actually growing really well. So we moved. We launched a, a premium plant based uh, spreads range. Um, this is very very good. It's it's exceptionally hard to tell it's not dairy. So you look out for that. It's um it's getting a lot of traction and the, it's come up really well. You know, as mentioned before, it, the plant-based business itself is continuing to grow. I know it's quite, probably going, you know, 15, 20% a month. Um, there's a lot of people out there that, that are actually sharing their, their sort of um, their eating habits. They're not going 100% vegan, but they're definitely choosing at least one meal a week. So, and the products are getting better and better all the time. Um, the, the actual, um, it's so hard to tell that they're not, um, not real meat, as you've seen with V2. And, and obviously with our products, we're using cashews to make ice cream and, and obviously we use cashews to make cheese as well, uh, as long as other nuts. Um, our, our independent relationship with their IGA stores really was a great boost for our Woodbridge Smokers business last year. Um, we had massive, you know, 1,500 outlets were across the country were able to be secured to, to have our Woodbridge Smokehouse range. And that, that is a premium end. We're at one of the highest price on the shelf and um, we're actually outgrowing most other sound producers um, in that space through independence, which has uh, been very exciting. Yeah, so um, that's that's all I've got to say. Um, more than happy to take some questions um, when you're ready, Mark. Thanks, Michael. Uh, yeah, I must just uh, kick off the, the first one. I know you had a, um, a map there of, you know, where you're supplying into in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, but what the in terms of revenue, what's the kind of split between domestic uh, revenue and export revenue? Is you know exports ten percent of the business, or or where where does it sit currently? Uh, last year, export was about yes, about ten percent of the business. 
uh, last year. It's um, the majority of our export um, products is through Woodbridge Smokehouse. Um, and as I said, that was closed for the first three months of this year. So I reckon our export percentage will be lower this year as such. What it does allow us, we have the relationships with the large retailers in Asia where we are just helping them about selling them other products, like talking about ice cream especially. There's a lot of um, vegan people um, in Asia and obviously they have dairy intolerance as well. So we're very excited about the opportunity. Um, once our filling line is up and running, um, we'll have the capacity and we'll start those. We've had early conversations, samples have been sent and um, it's been very, very, um, very, very uh, exciting to see that they're, um, they're very keen to produce the next level with that product. And then just in terms of distribution, um, you know, from Tassie, do you go, how, how does that work in terms of, do you have uh, facilities in, I don't know, Melbourne or, or Sydney where, you know, you're supplying all these like Woolwork Metro stores and, and IGA outlets, like just talk us through how you get from the production plant, uh, wherever it might be in Tassie to actually distributing it on the mainland. Yes, no problem. So we basically, um, we ship the product overnight. So we have a really good transport and the freight, the access to Tasmania is very, very good. We've got two brand new fast ships and we've got um, four, four other ships that go on a daily basis. Um, the fast ships um, travel in the summer twice a day. Um, that's a TT line. So that's who we, we can have product. We can leave product here in Hobart and we can be put into a DC in Woolworths DC um, tomorrow morning at about 10 a.m. So there's no, um, there's no real challenges in transport. Um, through the independence, we use a partnership that range it there with a, with a large um, provider um, who actually service those customers. So we actually sell them to their DCs. Um, the which, the Moore West Metro, we go direct to store. Um, so we have a very good supply chain system. One of our transport companies who have a direct to store model, which we just go direct to store. So, Logistics wise for us, it, it sounds challenging because where we're based, but um, the system works pretty well. I've been doing this for about um, you know, 35 years now. So the one thing is a benefit for us is we get a federal um, rebate from the federal government. If you're, if you're a manufacturer in Tasmania, um, the federal government give you a rebate per pallet to get the product to market. The idea of that is it makes best trade um, relative to a normal highway, the cost between Melbourne and Sydney. So very good system and it allows us all Tasmanian producers to be competitive. Okay, and uh, just want to focus on the the cashew creamery business for a second. Um, I mean, how do you keep up with demand? Uh, uh, in terms of just physical production on one side, and then you know the ability to source, uh, you know, cashews are, uh, as well on the other end. Um, you know, is it, you know, the breakneck growth that you've seen is it causing bottlenecks for you yet or you have you been able um, to uh, you know pull various strings and levers to, to kind of meet demand as, as it comes through the door yeah no it's a, it's a good comment it's a good question actually because um you know when we first started the business we acquired it just from a, a mum and dad a small operator and it was all manually done we realized early in the board supported the proposal to order a brand new uh, turnkey line which came out of italy um that was originally meant to be here about five months ago. Um, it's only just turned up in the last two weeks. So the labor cost was really high in, in FY22 for us because it was all done by hand. Now, as I said, they're commissioning the line today. So, you know, by the end of the week, we will potentially be able to produce as much as we were doing in a week, we'll be able to do in one day. Um, so yes, we did need to forward plan and the, and the board supported the acquisition um, of the, and the investment was close to a million dollars. Um, so, it just gives us large capacity. We can improve the quality of the product. We can add more flavor range. We can do swirl product, which we haven't been able to do before. Um, so we're about to launch a new tub range as well, which will get us into the tub market. Um, so, you know, pretty excited about the opportunity there, um, but the demand is, is super strong. Um, the, the supply of the raw materials, that, that's really quite easy. That's not hard. We, we source the raw materials, um, pretty well from a couple of different countries and we haven't had any issues as such. I mean, we've all had to be ahead of the game a bit with logistics and, and slowing down, which I think everyone in food and beverage manufacturing is sort of forward, um, forecasting more raw materials to be on site. Um, but apart from that, um, you know, the same with the Tasmanian Pate, we've got a $800,000 worth of investment coming in, which will increase our capacity, um, improve our yields and, and be better for the environment with a better, more recyclable packaging. So we've been, that project's once again, been on the go for a year um so we've had to sit for a year and 
with challenges with um, with high labour content. So um, that was the effect of earnings last year. Um, but you know, we've already seen with initial automation that comes into the business, we've already seen some some more positive earnings coming through. And then uh, I just want to touch on um, the hospitality sector. Um, you know, if anybody was in Europe this summer or even even read the paper, you know, hospitality, you know, just had a massive boom after COVID. And obviously we're coming into peak season now in Australia over the next, let's say, for four months. If we start from Cup Day today to let's go to, to um, Australia Day at the, the end of January. Um, your share of of revenue that goes directly into the hospitality is it is it you know sizable or is it is still oh, it's not small massive. We, we to, sort of, to markets? Um, yeah, we sort of um, we sort of took it easy on food. We call it food service. So we took it easy on food service. Obviously, COVID it was pretty well shut, um, and we were lucky we weren't impacted for that reason. Um, we have started focusing more on it now. Um, we've just launched a new plant based shredded cheese range, which is um, to go on pizza and, and all sorts of meals and all chefs. And it's a very, it sounds easy, but it, um, to get plant-based cheese to melt is quite hard. It needs very high temperature. So we have to develop a new range of plant-based cheese, shredded cheese, which melts at a lower temperature, um, same as mainstream cheese. So that's been a huge success. And we've just started supplying the major food service companies in Australia. So that's very exciting. So um, they're making lots of shredded cheese at the moment. So yes, we are focusing now that the doors are back open. Um, we were lucky we weren't impacted too much because we weren't relying on it pre-COVID. And um, I, I know we talked uh, earlier, or the, the back end of last week, um, you know, about the, you know, takeovers we've seen at Tassel and and and, and a few other, the, the fish guys down in, in Tasmania. Acquisitions as part of your strategy. I mean, there's quite a number of brands under the under the umbrella currently. Um, but is that something we we should be thinking about as we progress yes. through FY23? Or I mean, it sounds like you've got a lot on your plate with a, a lot of projects that you know have been ongoing for twelve or eighteen months that just all seem to be coming to fruition now. Um, or, or where, where does acquisitions rank in terms of pro uh, to, the to do list? Oh, absolutely. Like we're, um, you know, very engaged in that space. We've got um, a couple of people actually be working all the time. Um, and we've looked at quite a few, probably three or four in the last 12 months. But, you know, we've always said, and I've been a very open up front, we want to grow this business to 100 million revenue. Um, so we are going to continue to acquire. Um, you know, we, we're in a great space. You know, we've got, as I said before, we've got over eight and a half million dollars worth of available money, um, which for a small cap of our size is pretty impressive. Um, you know, we were cash flow positive um, for the month of September. Um, you know, we're on our track to be, to be washing our face by the end of the financial year. So um, that's a huge turnaround for we were. So we're a very, very strong balance sheet. Um, so the business is in a really good shape. Um, brands are growing, marks improving, um, cash is there. Um, so we're pretty excited. So we are definitely looking at opportunities for acquisitions. Um, you know, any acquisition that we would look at anything really to a point that fits within our DNA. Um, but super excited about it so yes we will be definitely acquiring um got to find the right the right one um, we don't acquire for the sake of acquiring but um we're definitely looking where we can okay great and any particular uh you know area that you're looking at that would you know complement some of the, the existing ones or even push you into a new area what what would be the like kind of focus is it more complimentary ones that you know you you that would fit uh, you know neatly on the shelf beside some of the some of the other brands or or, or try and get onto a new shelf completely um i think it's really important that whatever we do acquire next we get some synergies um you know if you keep acquiring and you have no synergies you end up just costing more and more to produce um so whatever we whatever we do um purchase we'll make sure it does fit in the same supply chain as us. So we get some more um, synergies in the supply chain. Um, or I say location is important as well. And also the DNA behind the brand, you know, how's the brand produced? Where's the product coming from? Where's the raw materials sourced? Is it done ethically? Is it um, better for the environment? Is it more recyclable? That's really important for the consumer. So it's really important. We really look at those things hard and, and we're looking at <clears throat> we're looking at all sorts of opportunities. And we've looked at seafood, we're looking at um, Beverages, um, you know, so beverages was my forte. So I spent 35 years doing that. So 
know that pretty well and whether that's alcoholic or non-alcoholic, I'm not sure as yet, but um, definitely whatever we do, we need to make sure it ticks those boxes before we move to the next step because there's no point us just bolting on something that we get no efficiencies from or logistics efficiencies. And um, you, you talk about the, the commissioning and the lines and, and a few other CapEx projects that are you know going to complete, let's say, this, this side of Christmas. Any other major CapEx projects that are going to kick off in, in let's say, calendar year 2023? Or are you kind of uh, at a good spot now to, to, to just kind of leverage what, what the investment that's been made to, to date? Yeah. Yeah, no, we have actually... Our CapEx program, after, as you said, you have uh, pretty well know it there, the first half of this of FY23 will be done. Um, we've got very, very small CapEx, just r and as such after that. Um, we've spent a lot of money in CapEx since the journey, so over two and a half years. And looking back through the numbers, you'll see the investment we've done. You know, we sort of had to, you know, build new factories and fit factories out. And, you know, it goes along with that, the little services costs, so a lot of one-offs. Um, but they're done now. So we, we have our CapEx program into, into the balance. The second half of 23 is very, very small. Um, it, there may well be some CapEx if we're able to secure some more major grocery retail business where we need some, um, some more capacity. But at this point of time, we haven't budgeted for that. We'll just see what's around the corner. Okay, great. And then in terms of trying to... Uh get new uh customers i mean it sounds like you're in pre you know you're in iga you're in woolworths um the plan to move into to the as you said a petrol and convenience you, you, you're not that's like one area of, of retail that you're not in currently um what i mean what is the product that would uh i'm trying to think of what is the the kind of more suitable product to go into that or is it developing a you know a custom product uh, that you know fits for that specific retail outlet. Um, well, we've got a couple of products there to fit straight in. We've got our um, cashew ice cream. Um, ice cream is sold a lot in PNC, um, so we've got a, very much a focus on on getting our plant based ice cream into PNC. Um, so that's easy. Um, and the other product is our um, potato and gravy. We do a, a two fifty as well as a four fifty. Um, the 250 is something that can sit in a hot box alongside the, the meat pies or the, or the barbecue chickens in a lot of convenience stores now have become very, very convenient and, and big on, on the go food. Um, and we see that fitting that space as well. We also do small ready to eat salads, 160 grams. So, you know, we've got two or three products that we can actually set up ready to go now that are developed ready for PNC. So very, um, very excited about the opportunity to, to knock on those doors and um, get the ranging there. And is yeah, is that similar to to retail? You could you kind of have to get it done at a, a corporate brand level rather than um you know trialing it with ten or twelve in, independents. Is it is it more we you, you it's that corporate negotiation to range yeah. it in all of their outlets in Victoria, for example? Yes, that's correct. Yep. So we go to major um you know all the major chains of, of PNC. So. We do some, we, we've been lucky enough, there's some more independent chains of PNC down here, which we do some work with, and we've done a lot of testing with those guys. Um, so you've got to try and you've got to make sure that you've got data to prove that the product sells. Um, that really helps your case when you go and present to major PNC. So it's no different than dealing with Woolworths, Coles, Audi, Costco. Um, it's the same sort of model. Okay, perfect. Michael, um, thank you very much for joining us. It was great to hear the the story firsthand. I know we're uh, maybe running a minute or, or two early, but um, let's uh, let's leave it there because I do know uh, George is uh, standing by to, to to take over. And uh, yeah, let's uh, we'll keep an eye out for uh, these brands hitting the shelves at a at a store near you. I think is uh, is the the, the takeaway from today. Uh, thanks very much, Mark. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, thanks, Michael. And yeah, we'll uh, hopefully catch up maybe uh, in uh, 2023 at some stage. I look forward to it. Cheers. Uh, and yeah, thanks for stopping sharing your screen. And uh, George, if you want to start sharing yours. Uh, I'll sure, we will do. And I can see you coming. Can you hear me? Uh, well, I can hear you perfectly. Yep. Okay, awesome. Hi, Mark. Morning. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'll let you know once it's uh, coming up on screen.
Yeah, it's coming through now. And yeah, if you just move into uh, blend mode or full screen mode there, George, just to get the full effect of it. Is that uh, yeah. full screen for you now? Yeah, that looks perfect. Uh, so good to go whenever you are, George. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks for having me. Um, and uh, I guess I'll just get straight into it. Uh, so uh, I'll skip over the disclaimer and take it as um, take it as understood that obviously this is not advice. Um, we are Halo Technologies, and we're a um, recently listed fintech business trading under the ticker HAL. Uh, we listed in April 22 this year, uh, raising a net 19 million to fund our global expansion as well as um, sort of continued domestic expansion. Uh, we are a provider of research and trading systems. Um, we, our typical user base tends to be um, older and wealthier than most of our peers. So, um, you know, in, in this space, really, most people tend to equate us with the self-wealth, the stakes, uh, those types of guys. Um, we're not really after the same clientele as those guys. So ours tend to be older, tend to be wealthier, and um, I'll sort of talk more later as to how we access that demographic. We've, we've built the product, it's been built by industry professionals with a view to it being usable by industry professionals. So um, the uh, senior executive team, the founders, uh, we come from uh, predominantly a funds management and uh, stockbroking backgrounds. And we wanted to build software that uh, we could use ourselves to invest with. So it, um, it combines fact set data, uh, including the consensus estimates, to give a, a level of detail and features comparable to uh, the part of a Bloomberg terminal that we would use on the equity side or, or the, the fact set side as well, but for a fraction of the price. So obviously a Bloomberg terminal is roughly 2000 US a month. Um, we sell the product, that's roughly the annual rate for, for the professional side. Obviously, we don't have the breadth of product that those guys do, but on the equities portion, that sort of niche that we're in, uh, we believe that we provide a comparable research experience. We're sold predominantly in the B2B space uh, as a tool to enable advice businesses to better manage and monetize their client bases. So uh, it's the benefits are twofold, really. It's a, a streamlining process for the advisors. We've sort of worked closely with the uh, early adoption advisor groups to create a software platform that really works how they want it to work. Um, so better order in their workflows, allowing them to look after either more clients or, or um, the same client base with uh, using less time. We also represent a new revenue stream for those advisors, for the ones that want to be resellers. So not all advisors opt to resell the product onto their client base, but those that do, we uh, go into a, a revenue share arrangement with them, which is essentially 50-50. Um, and that's an entirely new revenue stream for those guys. Uh, we've continually innovated. So we, we've had always been in, in that B2B space from inception. Um, and we've listened to the advisor feedback really closely and been in regular contact with them to rapidly iterate the improvements to the platform to make it as usable and as useful as possible for them. As I mentioned earlier, the end user base tend to be older and wealthier than um, you might expect based on a, a sort of overview of who you could think that we're competing with. Um, that that sort of comes from uh, two angles, one being that we're predominantly sold through the B2B channel. Um, obviously, in, in that space, um, advisors, clients tend to be, tend to skew a bit older, tend to skew a bit wealthier. Um, and price wise, we're, we're certainly, while we're a lot more affordable than something like a Bloomberg or a Faxet, uh, we, we still represent a, a decent cost for someone uh, as an end user. Uh, so you wanna have 
a decent amount of farm in order to justify that expense. Um, we offer the, the broadest access to international shares in the market with over 35,000 listed securities. Um, obviously, client interest is naturally dominated in the sort of major expected markets being the US, UK, Europe, um, but this breadth is a key differentiator. Uh, we've in the past attracted certain clients based upon our ability to offer a particular exchange or stock that they could not get elsewhere. Um, with the increase in domestic interest in international shares, we think we're well positioned to benefit from this, given that we combined this broad product breadth, which is the broadest in the market, I believe, with um, a really easy to account op um, opening process um, and a, a um, intuitive trading interface. We've got a, a number of thematic portfolios, which are termed the views. Uh, they're a, a research product that uh, if the client takes them up, they pay a fund fee for. We charge that in a simple and transparent manner. Uh, with uh, none of the usual sort of platform fees or anything like that. It's just a, a single fund fee. Uh, each view is a research portfolio that aims at a particular target theme, which is, um, I think that's a, a, an attractive proposition for um, the cohort that's perhaps a little bit younger than our existing clientele uh, and speaks to um, how they might think about investment. So they may have a view on where um, a particular market is going to be in 10 years time, whether it's, you know, more vehicles will be electric. How do they play that? Obviously, everyone just buys the, the Tesla share, but there's actually a number of different ways to play that. And so we offer um, a thematic portfolio that uh, allows them to acquire 10 stocks that are exposed to that particular theme. Um, it's, uh, it, it does probably speak to a, a slightly younger cohort and it's a product that um, is, uh, is in its infancy for us. It, it doesn't represent a large share of revenue currently, but we do also offer the, the option for uh, advisors using the platform to create their own custom views and expose them to the, their clients. Uh, we were a research platform before we were a trading platform, so we built the research capabilities. Um, we acquired the trading capabilities along with the, the uh, thematic portfolios with the acquisition of MacReview in May 2019. That was um, a business that was partially owned by the AMP Ventures um, business, uh, as well as a number of other shareholders. We've retained this sort of research first approach, which we believe is a, a key differentiator in the market and is um, well suited to the user base and clientele that we're targeting, being that they're older, they're wealthier, they're more sophisticated, and that they're, they're not looking for a sort of bare bones trading platform experience. It also allows us to compete on um, something other than price. Obviously, in the, the trading platform space, there does appear to be a bit of a race to the bottom in terms of fees. Uh, we don't particularly want to be involved in that. We, we uh, aim to be good value, but not necessarily cheap. So we, we um, don't aim to compete on price. We aim to compete on functionality. Uh, we're using the, the FactSet database. Um, but we expose it to our client base in a, into an easily usable format and for a, a fraction of the price. It's a very sophisticated data set um, and we do various custom manipulations that um, allow uh, investors to make better decisions more easily. That's, that's the aim of what we're exposing to investors. Uh, we think that um, if you expose too much information, with um, sort of no, no structure around it, it's unlikely to be usable by the average uh, investor. Um, as you can see on the, the right-hand side of the screen, um, as I've spoken to the sort of end user demographics, you know, we're, we're definitely not the sort of Robin Hood's uh, 
in that sort of Robin Hood type space, you know, over 50% of the portfolios loaded on the platform are of $500,000 or more. Um, and 75% of the users are uh, aged 50 or above. Uh, since listing in late April, We've obviously been uh, very busy uh, and a couple of those things have come to fruition. So the first is uh, a partnership that we've signed with Success Publishing. They're the uh, Australian license holder of the um, Forbes Australia brand. So they're running the, the first um, Australian only Forbes um, magazine. Uh, they're running a, a load of Forbes Australian events. Um, we uh, invested in that business for a convertible note and as part of that overall transaction we've signed um, an exclusive collaboration agreement as well as a referral agreement. This allows us um, a number of sort of touch points across that Forbes business. Um, importantly, uh, we are the only uh, group in the space that we are in being research and trading that can be at the events that can expose the Forbes clientele to the types of products that we sell. We're currently working with the um, Forbes Australia guys to come up with a load of custom products as well as custom offerings to put in front of uh, their client base. And we think that's a really fantastic demographic for us. It's high end, it's aspirational, and, and it's really credible for a consumer brand. Uh, so it, it um, really sort of fast tracks the um, sort of brand name getting out there, which we think has been one of the, the key lagging elements for us. Obviously we've sold in the, the B2B space predominantly. Um, and so from a consumer perspective, we're a bit of an unknown quantity. Um, the the other thing that we've been busy doing is um progressing the the sort of pipeline of b2b uh deals that we have in the works we've got um a pretty full pipeline i guess um and uh so we've recently uh converted one of those uh to put the, this deal into context when we listed we had around 200 or 210 million dollars in fun on the platform uh, now, these, as, so we've signed up a, a um, Sydney based dealer group that has 25 corporate authorized reps underneath it. And we've started off speaking to the uh, cars underneath them, and we've converted a couple of them so far. So one has one is an advisor with $300 million, and the other uh, is an advisor with $500 million. Now, the sort of structure of these advisory relationships means that the impact will be more muted than if we just um, sort of quadrupled the, the thumb on the platform. The historical thumb on the platform uh, comes from general advice advisors, so sort of more your traditional stockbroking. They, they tend to be um, higher turnover. Um, and the advisors that we've signed are personal advice advisors. So um, what that means is that it'll take around a year for that fund to come on the platform as um, advice falls due and is delivered and then subsequently implemented. It also means that the actual structure of the advisory relationship will be much lower turnover. So most of this will be written under an SOA. Uh, the, the advisor will transact and then probably won't transact again uh, for another year, if even then. Uh, so much lower turnover, but still um, decent farm growth and decent activity. Uh, we've got a, a really solid pipeline of opportunities like that, um, as well as a decent pipeline of opportunities in the sort of general advice and no advice space. Um, so, so this is really how we intend to grow. Uh, domestically, you know, we sell predominantly through our B2B relationships. It's, it's really natural when you consider who our core user base consists of, being that they're older and wealthier, and they're therefore really likely to be in an advised relationship of some kind, whether it's the uh, personal advice relationship, general advice, or um, even just a, a subscription to some sort of newsletter type product. 
it, it provides a really straightforward way for us to reach our relevant user base and it puts us into partnership with their existing advisor rather than into competition. So we uh, represent, if the, if the B2B wants, we can represent a brand new revenue opportunity for them um, and a new way to monetize the relationship which they have with their clients as well as all of the improvements to their workflows that allow them to look after a, a greater number of clients. We're also seeing that more and more advisors are moving into the direct equity space. Uh, this is a trend that we expect will continue due to the sort of additional transparency and, and customization available because of it. Um, and then in the B2C space, this is really, um, this has almost been a, a bit of a, an afterthought for us. We deliberately haven't wanted to be in competition with um, our B2Bs, um, but we want to have it there as a, a sort of offering that's maybe at a, a slightly lower price point, a lower touch point. Um, and we think that all of the problems that we're currently solving on that side at the moment will translate into solutions on the B2B side as well. So most of it is, um, you know, we represent a pretty high ticket price product for someone who you've you've never heard of before so how do you build that credibility how do you build that ease of use these are you know it's a combination of marketing improvements and um, software improvements and we think that solving those problems on the b2c side are not going to go to waste on the b2b side uh, we're predominantly a, a SaaS business and our revenue mix reflects that. So um, bulk of our revenues are subscription sales. Um, these are annuity style uh, subscriptions. Um, they're typically uh, two to three year terms. Um, we um, account for them in the p and uh, on a monthly basis, essentially, uh, as the sort of subscription moves from uh, on end to end revenue, uh, which provides a really, really smooth um, revenue line in the PL. We've also got the uh, brokerage, and, and when I say brokerage, we're bundling both the um, actual stock brokerage and the associated FX fees where applicable. That obviously moves around a lot more uh, with market conditions and activity. Um, so moving forward, we've got uh, quite a lot of ways that we're, we're going to grow the business. So the um, domestically, uh, we're looking at continued organic growth. We've got a couple of software enhancements domestically, and we've got one um, uh, integration with a major financial planning software that um, we think will open up a load of the um, personal advice targets that have currently stalled due to not having that integration. So we expect to see quite decent deal flow as a result of that. Um, historically, we've served newsletter subscription and general advice businesses predominantly, um, but we've, we've listened and made a number of changes that better enable us to serve advisors delivering personal advice. Um, and so that's why we've seen the, the, um, the ones that have come on board so far recently. We've also got a team overseas currently that are sourcing a number of potential transactions. And um, we're actually in the late stages of the negotiation of one of those currently. Uh, so we'll advise the market if and when that's finalized. Uh, near, to, near term, we have a new subscription product that's ready to launch very soon. It's a property focused subscription product that we expect will sell extremely well. Um, typically, what we see with the release of a new product is a period of extremely strong sales in the early stages as it appeals to both the existing user base and prospects who were previously unconvinced by past product offerings. Uh, this, coupled with the fact that Australia is completely property obsessed, makes us think that uh, we'll see really good sales once that product is released. Uh, we're continuing to work on technological enhancements, um, with most of those being driven by user suggestions, and in particular the heaviest users of the software being the advisors that we keep in close contact with. We've got a really strong pipeline of opportunities domestically that we're working on progressing. Um, these are uh, 
the, the B2Bs that I've mentioned, really, um, we predominantly sell through B2Bs. And so bringing on new B2B partners is pretty much the key way that we're expecting to grow domestically. Uh, each of these contracts have the potential to be extremely material in terms of the, the fund that they bring onto the platform. Um, and depending on the, the type of advisory relationship that that advisor has with their clients, um, the revenues that flow from that will either be more material or, or less material. So higher turnover advisors obviously mean more to us for a certain level of fund than, than lower turnover advisors. And, and when I say high and low, I mean that sort of typical personal advice, general advice type relationships, as well as the sort of idiosyncrasies of a particular advisor. Um, and so I, I guess uh, I'll finish up now. Uh, so these are the, the sort of summary points that I wanted to hit. So we're a, a profitable business. Um, we own our IP and we're in a... Um, uh, growing space. Um, we've got uh, strong leverage to the long-term growth prospects in the high net worth and sophisticated investors, both in Australia and glob globally. We've got a unique product offering. Um, we, we think we're at a really competitive price point. We're certainly not the, the retail trading apps, but we're a hell of a lot cheaper than a Bloomberg or a FactSet. Um, we've got an experienced management team in place that are, includes all of the founders um, and we're, we're currently fully funded for all of the growth that we expect to deliver. So we've, we've got the, the funds raised in the IPO. Uh, we spent a portion of that on the success publishing convertible notes and uh, the majority of that remains unused other than that. Uh, we're also aware of um, the market's desire for news flow and activity, and we've got a, a really solid pipeline of transactions that we're working on. And if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. Uh, George, I might just kick off with uh, with one or two. Um, in terms of, you know, you wanted to... Um, user groups you highlighted is the SMSF uh, market, which is obviously, you know, a market that's kind of exploded since, let's say, 08 or 09 uh, in Australia it existed before, but I think post GFC, it, it, it really took off. Do you market to those mm -hmm. people directly? Uh, you know, because, it, you know, if you combine a husband and a wife super in together, you know, you start getting into the let's say the lower end of your starting customer balance is that like kind of 300, 300K or is it more targeting that market but via their advisor who, you know, is is advising them maybe not on a, on a full-scale basis, but as you say, they are getting some kind of advice somewhere along the line. Yeah, we, we do a bit of both. So the vast majority of uh, users come to us through our B2B relationships, but we do also have a, a Google AdWords budget currently that we deploy both domestically and overseas. We bring leads in and we convert those those leads um, directly within Halo as well. But the, the vast majority of users come through B2Bs. And the take up from advisors of the of the revenue share model um what has that been like is it you know 10 percent of uh, of these new corporate authorized reps that you're bringing on or or you know kind of what's the the appetite for them to take on this new potential revenue stream well it, it sort of depends upon the space they're in so in the personal advice space they they haven't um but within the general advice space uh i believe they all have um, and so they, it then skews our revenue mix much, much more towards those general advice advisors, because rather than just representing a single advisor subscription, which is priced at a rate higher than the, the sort of end user rate, but um, it's still obviously quite immaterial compared to if the advisor were to resell that product onto his or her clients. So in terms of the, the number of advisory groups, uh, it means that two advisory groups represent the bulk of our subscription revenues. 
And yeah, that, that, that's a good uh, follow on to my next question on the advisor groups. I mean, we've seen a lot of changes in the advisor market over the last 18 to 24 months and, and continuing where, you know, you've got massive numbers of older advisors leaving um, because of the, mm. the, the new compliance and less independent advisors, you know, operating under their own AFSL, you know, they're moving under whether it be with Diverger or Centerpoint Alliance or, you know, there's a whole host of um, uh, kind of advisor groups. So when you're looking to bring new advisors on, is it targeting those more corporate ones? Are you still looking at, you know, independent advisors who have like that, you know, 25 that's, you know, it's maybe one guy who's got a license and now he's got, you know, 10 or 12 people he knows in the industry under his license? Yeah, well, the, the process that we normally follow, so we normally require a sort of advisor within the dealer group to, to almost champion the product. So dealer groups, it, when we are not a financial product, and so we do not believe that we actually require dealer, dealer group approval, but um, it's a lot easier if you're actively promoted by the dealer group and you get there by being actively promoted by an advisor who wants to use you. So we get in front of advisors, we find the advisors who are passionate about the product, and they're passionate about the product because they themselves are sort of in a minority. So the majority of um, financial advisors within Australia are not in direct equities, are not in international direct equities. You know, a lot of them stay away from that entirely uh the ones that do may be exposed via uh, either funds or or etfs um and so we generally get someone who champions the product from uh he he or she wants to use it and promotes it to the dealer group we then get in front of the dealer group and explain the benefits to the uh, end users as well as their advisors um, and that's the sort of process that we take and in terms of inter international markets, um, I think from the last result, if I remember correctly, all of your revenue today currently is is Australia based. Um, is there, you know, a split in the in the business? You'd like to see if we if we look out three years from today, um, in terms of what international revenue would look like versus uh, Australia revenue. Yeah, we, I mean, we really think that the international, so the history of the business is we started off as a um, Australian business that, that was a research business solely focused upon Australian equities. Over time, we expanded that. And so the all of the frameworks that we apply to the Australian equities landscape, we now apply to global equities and like truly global, you know, we use the um, interactive brokers guys as the as the um the source of uh international equities and they've got you know just incredibly broad product coverage um all the way down to stuff that you you wouldn't even vaguely consider trading um but we have, we use the same research frameworks um so whether it's the custom indicators or the the actual research products created by the the um, research team on that international data set uh which means that we've got this unique product that is genuinely usable by an international user and obviously the the market opportunity is just so broad overseas compared to the australian market even uh, just the uk so i think that the uk looks likely to be our first international um, expansion. And the size of that market dwarfs the Australian market, let alone if in three years time, we're in the US by then as well. I, I yeah, I, we, haven't, we haven't talked about what share of, of um, revenue split we would like to see, but I think um, just executing on the, the um, growth plans that we have means that ideally Australia will become a really quite small proportion of that revenue mix. 
And I mean, yeah, the UK market, uh, quite a, a similar market in some senses to Australia with, you know, self-invested uh, pension funds or SIPs as they call them there, plus the whole yeah. ISA stocks and shares uh, accounts, which, you know, not something Australian investors will be familiar about, but a very mature, well-established uh, product offering or our customer segment of the of the UK direct equities market. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And over time, I'm guessing, George, the the split between brokerage and, and subscription, I mean, the brokerage should become a smaller proportion over time as uh, more and more subscribers come on and, and the, the subscription revenue uh, picks up. Would that be fair to say? Well, so the, the client life cycle is that um, most clients come through the door and purchase one or multiple subscriptions before they open a trading account. And so subscriptions generally run ahead of brokerage. I, I personally prefer a heavier mix to the, the subscription side just because of the, the visibility that you, you get and you don't have periods sort of in the um the sort of uh, sec uh, second quarter for us of the second quarter calendar year uh, we're a, a December financial year end as well but the second quarter of the calendar year this year where you know activity really dropped off and I'd prefer us to be building a business that continues to be more subscription heavy rather than um, that activity dependent brokerage and FX fees. Okay. Perfect. George, we're right up on time. Uh, thank you very much for coming in and uh, giving us uh, the one-on-one on, on Halo Technologies. Uh, it sounds like there's uh, a lot of moving parts happening in the in the background that uh, we should be watching out for updates on over the next kind of three to six months. So we'll, we'll hopefully get you back in. Um, so December year end, yeah. So maybe March once, uh, once you've re reported in February. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Mark. Okay, thanks, George, and thanks everyone. And uh, I'll wish everybody a good rest of their Monday and good luck to everybody in the cup tomorrow. <laughs>